going to do a quick introduction, who they are and also what they're going to talk about. So please listen and then when you have questions, you know who to ask the specific questions to. We did receive a few questions beforehand, so um, we'll also throw in those in between. And we do have people joining us tonight online too. So um, just keep in mind we're also streaming and there might be some questions for you. Um, this, if this happens, then I'm going to put it off and then um, we can continue just normal without the mic because I am, there might be some technical difficulties tonight. Sorry about that. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to my team. <laughs> um, the me there, the 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 no, the and see if we can sort out what happened on the screen. <laughs> And then we had all the rest were females. 
and three of these females were seen in May also. And in July, we had our last shark sighting of our white shark. This was on the 6th of May. It's the same day that we had reported starboard in the bay. They had a quick feet response, and we have not seen any white sharks since. Thank you guys so much for listening. I'm going to pass you guys on to Sylvia, and she'll tell you a bit more of our species on the shark boat. So thank you, Brian. Uh, I'm just opening my presentation and then I'll start. Okay, I'm Silvia, I'm from Italy, <laughs> and I already graduated on my Master in Marine Sciences, and now I'm the other guy in the shark boat. So our other side are the short tail stingray. This one is the largest species of stingray around the world. It can reach in total length, so from starting from the uh, the tip in the mouth, like the tip of the snout, until the uh, tip of the tail. They can reach up to uh, 5.3 meters in length, and uh, uh, they have a wide length, so wing length, so from one tip of the wing up there to other, other tip of the wing of 2.10 uh, meter in length. <laughs> yeah, they are big. <laughs> And um, for these species, we are starting with the identification of the individuals. So we can identify these individuals down to the spot they have on their um, head, so behind their eyes. And uh, um, for example here, uh, we identify this individual that is called sticky. So as you can see, they have uh, this white spot and they are um, unique for each individual. And since now we, are, uh, we have identified uh, 11 individuals, but our research is uh, continuing. Uh, so we hope to identify more of them. And uh, our sighting for uh, this year, starting from January, so we had uh, in January and February we identified 11 uh, sightings for the month. Then in March we had an increasing of uh, 22 sightings, and in April we had 38, and in May we had the um, top, like we had a peak of 52 individuals for a decreasing in June with 10. Uh, individuals and three in July. Uh, our other species uh, that we encounter pretty often in our trips is the seven gill, uh, the broad nose seven gill shark. This one is uh, uh, related to a prehistoric shark. So uh, let's say the name they have seven gills is the only existing species of their family that is called Exanchide, and uh, uh, we can see some picture. <laughs> and we saw in January and February three uh, sighting of this species, and in March we had four uh, for an increasing in April of 18, and a decreasing in May 3 and June and 2 in June. But now we are in July and we just have two weeks of July and we already had uh, 24 uh, sighting of this species. So in July um, there is a more sighting of the species. And we can uh, see also the species on our graphs. 
that are uh, baited underwater remote videos. So are basically there is this structure that is underwater around Dyer Island where inside there are sardines and there is one GoPro that is a touch of this uh, uh, structure and is left underwater so it will register videos and then we analyze these videos and we have uh, seen bronze, uh, uh, broad nose seven kill shark and we can identify them pretty much in the same way of the short daily stingray. So uh, the broad nose seven kill shark has this uh, particular white spot on their head that are different for each individual. And since now we are identified six individuals of them, but also for these species we are trying to identify more. And now I will give my word to Kelly uh, that will speak about our sighting also for marine mammals. Thank you. Good evening everyone, my name is Kelly and I'm just going to do a quick update in regards to our marine big fire sightings, uh, more specifically the whales and dolphins. So we have had a tough few months as we have all experienced the not so nice weather conditions hitting our area, which means we have had quite a high number of no sea days. However, for the days that we have been able to get to see, we have had some pretty exciting encounters. Now, the southern right whales have arrived again along our coastline. Our first sighting for this species was on the 28th of May. And in that specific sighting or day, it was actually two individual adult southern right whales seen in separate areas of the bay. So a good sign or a good start to the season for us. Since then, the sightings have been relatively consistent, so every few days we have had eyes on southern right whales. The bulk of these sightings have been uh, usually individuals with a few pairs, okay? All of them so far have been adult southern right whales. In regards to the behaviour, it has been quite timid, uh, with a lot of deep dives, moving quite quickly through the bay. Uh, however, there has been a few nice um, moments where they have stuck to the surface waters for us. <coughs> uh, we're hoping that uh, we will see an increase in numbers and will also activity, uh, of course with the hopes of encountering those mating groups as we head into August. Now, June and July has been spectacular for humpback whale sightings. Uh, this is a mix of breaching, fluking, pectoral slapping, and uh, it's primarily the adults that we have been seeing. There's been, uh, you know, the individual here and there, but there have been a number of groups seen, uh, up to uh, seven individuals in one sighting. Okay, a observation of note from last week: the team did encounter a cow calf pair. So what we're used to usually seeing at this time of the year is the adults as they head northward for reproduction. We would likely expect to see a cow-calf pair towards the end of the season, so later on in the year, as the females that have given birth up north are migrating southward again. So quite interesting to already see a calf, cow-calf pair, especially in this area of South Africa. Okay. Uh, the Brooders whale. Uh, we have had pretty consistent sightings for the first half of the year. Uh, again, ranging from adults to juveniles and cow calf pairs. Uh, whilst perhaps this isn't seen as the most active of whale species along this coastline, uh, and whilst this wasn't too recent a sighting, it was a highlight for the end of 2022. The team did encounter the rare sighting of a breaching Brutus whale, which is not commonly seen, and also a few encounters with lunge feeding adults behind the island system here. Okay. Uh, the dolphins. Now, our summer months did see a nice number of common and bottlenose dolphins moving through the area, but as we've progressed through the year, this has become less and less. 
We do, however, still frequently see the endangered Indian Ocean humpback dolphins visiting the area. Our most recent sighting was as of our Thursday morning, and we encountered a pod of six uh, just hunting just off the mouth of the estuary here. The, uh, we can't forget the biggest dolphins that we do see in the area, and that of course is the orcas. Uh, we have had two known encounters with the orcas this year already. The first one was on the 28th of February. They were seen at the southern edge of the bay there, and they were seen hunting broad nose seven gill sharks. Uh, fast forward, our second sighting was on the 6th of June, more so in the bay. They were actually seen from around the Francois coast area there, and the boats also saw them moving through through the through the bay. Um, as Rania mentioned, the 6th of June was the last time that the area saw a great white, and that does coincide with the last sighting of the orcas in the area as well. Okay. Uh, I will also mention that uh, the team is continuing to collect observational and photographic data on all of our trips. It includes but is not limited to the collection of the Indian Ocean humpback dolphin dorsal fin photos. This is for our own collection. We have just over 30 individuals that we've ID'd for the area, but it also has and most likely will contribute to the SUSE project. This is an intergroup collaborative work that is done for this species in South African waters. We also collect the images or photos of the Brutus whale's dorsal fin. Uh, this is to assist the uh, whale unit. And uh, with the lovely humpback whale sightings, we're working hard to collect fluke or tail images. And this is something that we submit to Happy Whale. Uh, our most recent submissions, including two very distinct tail patterns on the 11th of July, so just last week. I'm just thinking if I have anything else to add to this. <laughs> now, um, I do have just a short clip to show you all before I pass you on to Kalani so we can talk to you about the penguins. Just uh, a few um, clips of our humpback whale encounters, our humpback dolphin encounters, and there is a sneaky southern right whale clip in there from last year as well. Thank you very much, everyone. I will pass over to the audience. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Kalani Lago. Uh, I work for African Kingdom in the Sanctuary, and I've been there for eight years now, but working with humans for 14, 15 years now. So, um, most questions I get from the people that are human, or, or I said, no, there's not a chance. Because my work is fun. And uh, dealing with the clever birds 
and uh, most people they are not really aware about that. And that is why every day, if I meet people, I always invite them to come and see the work I'm doing there. So sometimes it's like a threat, uh, especially if we talk and then there's an um, disagreement or something, and then I'll invite them to come and volunteer. And doing that, I know I've got two or three beds that might sort you out. <laughs> but you're not really aware because um, what happened maybe last month. Yeah. So what I do at EPS is that we do save penguins or we rescue penguins. And um, I always make sure that I tell everyone, you know what, it's very important that to respect the fishermen because most calls come from them and sometimes like midnight then. So the first question is that, what were you doing at 2 o'clock in the morning? You phoned me that there is a penguin that we found earlier on, but you never phoned me. So, but I don't complain, I go out and go fish the penguins. So what is very important is that um, the first five days, we always keep them separate from the rest of the penguins. And uh, the following day we do take bloods, we do blood smears and we also spin it just to do a cells count. So that's really important. And um, sometimes we name um, the penguins because it's easy when you um, phone me and ask about your penguin, how is it doing? If it's got a number, remember every year from um, January till the end of um, December, we give numbers. Then. So you asked me about um, AP7, African Penguin number seven, which is uh, for eight years I've been getting African Penguin number seven. So if you mention that, okay, the name of that penguin was, okay, then I would easily understand and go, go back and check the file and give you the report. But we try our best like, to um, inform everyone just to keep that interest so that if you go out fishing or you walk on the beach, uh, just keep close eye and um, because these guys are endangered, and um, today we are sitting on 10,000 breeding pairs. So 2015, when we opened pairs, it was like 18,000 breeding pairs. So the number is still decreasing badly. So it's very important we have to have more people on our side. Just to look at us, because just a team of four people. So if we use the community or any visitors, please look out for these pairs and. Um, Report or any time, the number is 24 hours. So in the beginning, I told him, I said, you know what, I think I'll switch off my phone at 8 o'clock, but that's not how it works. Then. So I signed for this job, so that's it. So 24 hours, and um, yeah, we try our best to educate uh, people that come to apps. Uh, we do have small coffee shop, so that is why I'm passing this message. So I used to have local people that I know that every Sunday they would come and support us there. So now I think after COVID, I don't see those big numbers there. So I'm just trying to pass a message. Yeah, I know I have to talk about the penguins, but I need to mention this. Please guys, don't let us down. Come. We have cheesecake, carrot cake, and brownies. Yeah. <laughs> just away from the penguins there. So last year, we managed to um, rescue about 336 penguins from January till the um, end of December. And um, mostly it was the, the abandoned chicks. It's like every second year, we do get uh, chicks that are abandoned by the parents for the molting season, clutching with um, breeding season there. So before, the year before last, it was um, bad flu. So um, also very busy, but I know from the beginning when we opened EPS, it used to be every second year we we'll get lots of penguin chicks, and we need more hands to help us because the team of um, five people we start at six o'clock in the morning, getting ready, cutting fish tails and um, crushing medication, do the electrolytes, and then. By the time you finish the morning uh, shift, it's around, around about half past 12. Then it's almost time to get ready for the afternoon feed. So that means there's not much time. So that's where we lose most people who come to volunteer and they, they complain that we stand too much, but that's our job. So the guys ask or the penguins ask for food. So they don't stop. Yeah, it seems I've uh, been sitting and checking and said, no. It takes almost 30 minutes um, for a message to deliver from the stomach to the brain that you know, 
you've been fed, but they keep on asking them. So, <clears throat> we didn't have a lot of penguins that were um, affected by the bad flu, but uh, the Cape Comorites, uh, Dyer Island alone, we've lost like um, 30,000 um, of those Comorites from the bad flu. And the bad news now, it is back. So, yeah. Um, now, I picked up two days ago, um, they call it the Southern Moon. I had the presence of Epsilon in the tub over there, so we were just sitting there and um, just stop and then I pick it up. Lucky I have used a towel and then we take the swabs and we left and then we came back positive. So it's not only penguins, seagulls, um, common tents, even these wild birds now are getting it. So and the reason I'm mentioning this is that uh, sometimes they get calls, uh, especially locally, and then they have. Um, the uh, freshwater beds, and when I said, no, no, we are not allowed to admit these beds. And then it sounds like maybe we don't want to do our job or we can't get our way back. It's a risky. There's no show for bed flu. So if you've got it, or oh, we get it inside apps, then we might have to close the center for six months. So it's very tricky. So please, if you phone me about the bed and I said I cannot take it in, even though I try by all means to come up with a plan. But please understand that it's risky for us. So right now, um, focusing on all the sick beds that come in, and then I have two guys and the IMV volunteers helping us to feed the penguins. Sometimes we might come and watch the penguin feed and they don't see me that side. So I might be busy at the back or hiding because uh, <laughs> for being there for eight years and then as being told, no, I'm not allowed to touch any of these penguins. And I have my favorite penguin inside there, which is, some of them know, uh, her name is Bill Tom. So, <laughs> so it's really um, not fun for me to watch someone else kind of feeding Bill Tom and I'm not there, I'm not involved. <laughs> so I love to keep my relationship close with those penguins. And they are more like a family to me. So yeah, um, not a chance that I get bored of doing my job. So this year we already have like um, 40 penguins, like the numbers uh, what have been admitted, and we've released, um, I think two weeks back, we've released 14 penguins back on the island. I've got eight now that I might have to talk to any, and um, they are ready to go. So all of those beds we do uh, put microchip just to keep um, um, track on, like not that we um, checking them or we see where they're going, but only if they arrive with the colonies. We have um, ground readers, so it works like an old speed trap. So there's a cable that is being laid down on the island on the colonies. So when they return um, from fishing or out at sea, then they have if they jump over that cable, then they send the signal. So that's how we know that um, two of our penguins were released last year. They end up in Eastern Cape um, on Bay Island. And then I think there is one that was in um, Cape Town, um, Robert Island, yeah. So we picked up three for a recent uh, by this guy, Sanko, in Cape Town. Uh, 2018, it's the hand-raised penguin, and they've been with us, I think, last year. And um, we don't incubate penguins' eggs, um, because I'm scared, you know what? It's very tricky. Those guys, it's not easy to tame. But if you hand raise a penguin and then they get attached and then they imprint, then you will be thrown. Was I've noticed with the one I picked up, um, Ramanas, he was uh, having an example. And every time it's feeding time, I open the gate. He's always the first penguin up there. And then he kind of chase all the other birds away because he just wanted special attention. But we gave him a second chance. If you manage to survive for three years, I would see so he's gone now, but we haven't transformed a number. So I keep on um, taking every um, time we um, before we release. And um, yeah, the penguins bite you for no reason sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so I tell people I still come to work every morning even though they bite me. So not that they hate me, sometimes they're confused. And so as soon as they realize, you know what? For three days, this person's been uh, bringing fish. It becomes more like a five-star hotel for them. 
So if they don't go, so I don't I understand it. But yeah, they have to go back in the world. So sometimes I'm not shy person, but when it comes to birds, yeah, I talk to them and if they understand it. And maybe you will look at it in a um, different way than maybe, is he crazy or what? No, I'm not. They understand me. <laughs> Sometimes I'll just um, ask a question. And then I know these three, if I move my head, they follow me. But if you're not really checking, you'll think they really understand what I'm saying. So it's the head movement that I'm doing there. So yeah, it is fun, guys. And, um, I also tell the parents, or just to encourage the, uh, the youngsters, you know what? Even if it's school holidays, you are more than welcome to volunteer. Even though we start from 16 years now to handle humans. But 13, 14, we make sure there is enough work for them. So, which is, um, if you tell us, okay, you're bringing three kids tomorrow, the guys now go to the laundry and take all of those cows off the cars. <laughs> and then throw newspaper at it just to have a uh, kind of work for them. So um, it's kind of fun. And then at the end, they will get photos and also the data from us saying that how much time they spent um, helping the birds or that. And then sometimes um, I'll go out before feeding, maybe 2 o'clock and check. So this family has been sitting here for almost an hour waiting for um, feeding them. So my focus, I always go um, focus on kids then, because I want them to remember, okay, how is it like to um, visit uh, the human center? So I always like, you know what, let's forget the rules. You and you and you, you follow me, and then I see, okay, the whole family is here. So I always try to bring the fun, okay, there's four kids, and then there's two parents. One of you is going to come with me and the kids. And then I check the reaction from the other parent. Okay, why are you here? Why is he leaving me behind? And now <laughs> I just kind of start the argument sometimes. Oh, I see, you know what? If you get here at 8 o'clock in the morning, I will take you to the bank and then you help me to scrap. And then you check the parent's face and that's why it should be. He said, no, that's my plan. I want them to wake you up in the morning. <laughs> So yeah, it was fun. So that was that I will never get bored doing my job there. So and also meeting different people uh, every week or every two weeks is also focusing on the volunteers. Sometimes yeah, the first two days guys I will act like no one, they don't pay any attention. Yeah, I am shy, but once you um, get to know me then you know no, he talks forever. So <laughs> that's my problem then. If I start talking, then it's not easy to stop. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's my problem. <laughs> because you want to play a lovely thing with you. Oh yeah, forgot about it. <laughs> <laughs> totally forgot. Yeah.
we're going to, at the end of October, there's the South African Sharks and Ray Symposium happening in, happening in Durban, and we're going to uh, present on these findings as well, and then also, at, that's also heading towards the public. You spoke about the seven gill shark in the, the bottom right hand corner. Absolutely beautiful animal. Uh, we actually deployed a few grubs on last Friday, and there was also like a seven gill shark hanging around in this area still. Uh, but yeah, still going on, still going strong. Uh, we're trying. Oh. <laughs> Yellow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we're trying about. We're trying about 20 deployments a month, uh, give or take, depending on the weather conditions. It doesn't always happen. Uh, but some fantastic <laughs> sightings. Octopus, absolutely lovely. <laughs> there we go. Um, but yeah, various shark species that we see in this area as well. And it's like one of our projects that we keep on move going on, uh, moving further. Uh, then also some uh, very interesting news. Uh, so, well, uh, uh, Grania spoke earlier about the Ori tags, so these are little uh, dart tags that people put in sharks and fish and stuff like that. Uh, mark recapture, you put it in, it's got a unique little code on it, and the next time the animal is captured, you can uh, read off the code, and you work with the Oceanographic Research Institute, and you can see where these animals are moving around the South Africa's coastline. How long are they hanging around in a particular area? Uh, yeah, where do they go? How long do they live? And some fantastic growth data coming out of that as well. However, there's a little bit of a problem there. That works only on species uh, bigger than 30 centimeters. And when you take a look at our little shy sharks, they've got a, you put the tag in right next to the dorsal fin, and you can see the dorsal fin area around the uh, cat shark is very, very narrow. So if you put a tag in there and you, uh, it goes wrong, you can damage that animal. And it's not something that you want. So we actually had a student, uh, Amy, who uh, she was one of our interns last year. She moved on to do her master's at the moment. And she decided to take a look at the spot patterns on these sketch sharks to see, can we track individuals over time using the natural markings, like a, very closely like a leopard. And she's found some very interesting sightings. Still, the project is still ongoing. So hopefully, like, we're definitely keeping an eye out on this project as well. And lastly, uh, we're also continuously monitoring our island crawls estuary. Every week we go, we look at the environmental parameters, temperature, dissolved oxygen, and salinity. And obviously, we look at our bird diversity as well. As, as some of you might have noticed, the uh, estuary at the moment is incredibly dark, but there's basically purely fresh water coming down the uh, river as a result of all the, the rainfall of the last month. So pretty much fresh water all the way down to the surf zone. However, as a result of that, you're also going to get a lot more freshwater bird species hanging around the estuary, your yellow-billed ducks, your cape shovelers, all of those. So yeah, we've been monitoring that as well. Uh, gray heron still hanging around. We saw a purple heron the other day as well. Absolutely fantastic. And last week we saw uh, four juvenile fish eagles circling the estuary with two adults hanging around as well. So absolutely unique encounter. Um, makes me love this estuary more and more every time I go. And yeah, that's pretty much the, a short update on some of the stuff we're doing. Of course, we're doing other projects as well, but some of it is like a little bit slower, underground, slow moving, all of that kind of stuff. But yeah, thank you for listening. Just need to find the magic spot here. <laughs> Alright guys, thank you for listening to everybody introducing themselves and just giving you a snippet of what they are working with and what you guys can ask each of these team members. On the screen you can see Mr. X here at the side. He is our senior bird rehabilitator and he's all about penguins. I'm just going to recap everyone quickly. Then we've got Grania. She is on white sharks and bronze whaler sharks. Sylvia, all the way from Italy, is um, talking about broad nose seven gills and short tail stingrays. Then we have Kelly Baker, all about whales and dolphins. And then Ralph is talking about our projects and research. All right, guys, so I'm going to open the floor.
I'm going to try this mic out, but like I said, if he's going to give us any trouble, I'm going to put it off. And when you ask a question, please make sure it's loud enough for everybody to hear. All right, thank you so much. Let's get going. why we stick around in the area when... Well, why did, you said they went up north to have their babies. So the, the question relates to reproduction in the whales. I mentioned um, the northward movements um, for reproduction. So it's very much species specific. So for example, with our humpback whales, they generally need the warmer waters for reproduction. So you'll find um, the adult whales moving up north to say uh, up as north as Mozambique waters for mating. Yeah, so they're going to go right up the coast here. Um, and then the females from the previous year's mating will come back to those warmer waters up north to give birth to the, their calf. Um, those warmer waters are just seen as a more comfortable or productive area for the humpback whale reproduction. Whereas our southern right whales, that species will actually come to this area, these cooler temperate waters for reproduction. So um, you may find uh, the mating happening at this time of year. We're hoping to see that coming in the next few weeks. Um, and then the females, again, from the previous year will come to give birth. So it's really species specific. Humpback whales, um, even your brooders whales, you know, you might find in the temperate to, to warmer waters. Um, but our southern right whales are going to reproduce, give birth in these cooler waters down here. So it's fine to stay here. I'm very much looking forward to the true southern right whale season where they, they have their calves in the area. I'd like to ask the how can we get rid of the sport us? Okay. Is going to work? Uh, All right. So yeah, it's really, really unfortunate about what's happening with the orcas and the white sharks and all of that. However, because we're not sure what the exact cause is, it is a natural phenomenon. Never mind that it is impacting our economic situation. It is natural. Uh, however, the yeah, this just requires like just to find out like more where are these guys coming from? Uh, what is the cause of what they are doing here? However, these are also marine mammals, and once you start crossing the line of, okay, I don't agree with this animal, let's shoot it, you're crossing a line that becomes easier and easier to move along, and then where do you stop? It's like, oh, what about uh, like a southern right whale or a humpback whale that also becomes a problem animal? Are we immediately going to jump to shooting that one as well, because it's a problem animal? Uh, so it's a very, very tricky line. At the moment, governments, uh, it sits with government, and at the moment their stance is we are not interfering with this because, it's a, as far as we are aware, it is a natural phenomenon. <laughs> they kind of went up at the same time. <laughs> I'll just talk loud. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, I think my uh, my question is for for Grain, Grania. Yeah, Grania. Okay. Um, you mentioned that you deal with the blue pointers. Sorry, the great whites. Um, six female sightings, one male sighting. Yes. Is there something there in depredation from the walkers, 
Well, the lady's smarter. <laughs> <laughs> it just happened like that. <laughs> 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 yeah. I'm, I'm going to take this one for, for Grania. Um, historically speaking, the white shark data for the area, there has always um, been certain times of the year where perhaps we see a dominance from the females or a dominance from, from the males. Um, historically speaking, again, uh, we would expect to see the dominance from the females for the majority of the year. Say perhaps nine months of the year, it would be a lot of the females coming through. Uh, then there's certain periods of the year where we would see perhaps an increase in the, the male grey whites. Um, an example would be, say, uh, pre-2017, we had a winter season where we had just moved to the island here and uh, it was male white shark, male white shark, male white shark. Yeah. Uh, whether or not the orcas have taken a liking for the males, um, I couldn't tell you that. Uh, or if the females are smarter, I'm not going to make that assumption. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, so also in Tanner and Dale in 2013, she did do a study on um, the great whites um, and how temperature can affect them. And the males seem to prefer the warmer water and the females seem to prefer the colder water. And so we have had the colder water in the last few months. There have been a lot more females than our males. And um, yeah, we're not sure about the purpose. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the question was how the research that we or yeah, your, your research, yeah, our research, how yeah, so how far it extends and how we uh, if we overlap with other groups as well. Uh, so the majority of the research that we do is primarily focused on the Khanspai area. However, because the, um, obviously our shark species do move around or are found elsewhere around South Africa, we do collaborate with other uh, groups around the coastline. Uh, we do some collaborations with SASC, the Shark Conservancy across the bay in Hermanus. However, we collaborate with people in Stellenbosch University, UCT, going all the way to Grahamstown with uh, the acoustic tracking array platform, so the acoustic tracking of animals around our coastline. Uh, those are pretty much the main people that we work with. Um, I know that C, uh, we collaborate with Sea Search with uh, the humpback whales as well. We collaborate with the whale unit in Hermanus as well. And some of those research, like if it overlaps, it extends outwards as well. So, yeah, I think that's pretty much a good <laughs> summary. Maybe just a follow on what you're saying. You sit and share research sometimes on this. Is, is your assistant even linked with it? So you can pick up information fairly available? In some situations, yes. So, so uh, for example, the acoustic tracking array platform that we work with. Um, so we look after some of the acoustic receivers of them and uh, there's a private array in the bay as well and if we tag an animal here then and if that animal moves around south africa all the way up to mozambique then if the data gets downloaded from their receivers they go, that goes to ATAP, and then we can turn to ATAP and go hey have you heard any of our animals moving around and then we get that data as well, and then vice versa. So if we download our data, we send it to ATAP, and then anyone else's research that uh, happens to any other person's tags popping up on the acoustic receivers gets picked up and shared as well. The acoustic tracking array platform runs pretty much from Cape Town all the way up to Mozambique, and yeah, so we share and collaborate on that front. Uh, yeah, we've done some stuff in, I think like we went to Mossel Bay last month in regards to a orc, uh, white shark uh, predation and cropsy there as well. So yeah, most of our research is very generally focused here, but because of its an the animals not only being found here, we collaborate across the country. And internationally. 
and yeah, and internationally. So I know that the uh, Pingming uh, with the Nest project, we've got collaborators in uh, America as well. A lot of our students and people come from Europe. Um, yeah, there's uh, like yeah, internationally, and like it's yeah. difficult to keep track of like where all those streams like huh? national and international. National and international, yeah. And local. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, slightly different question, so it's about this can't operate without funds. Funds is always fund dependent. Yeah. So my sister and I had the great pleasure of being in the coffee shop today, Penguin Sanctuary. Oh. Highly endorsed, you should definitely go and have the hot chocolates and the cake. <laughs> but what struck me there is we walked in and the place is plastered with sports vlog and advertising all over the place. BW, BW, BW. And I said to my sister, that's wonderful that a big international corporate is behind something like this. We were quite comforted that there's money. I need to be told by the centre that since lockdown, they've, been, they've pulled out, they don't, yeah. well, they don't get one cent for VW. Now, the problem I have, if that's true, yes. the VW should back pay them in funds for having their, their, their advertising with all this time. Agreed. If it's wrong, then the centre shouldn't you know, have misinformation. Now, when I went to, if I walked in there today and they said, desperately needing an international sponsor, and you view it with a different sub, but you walk in there, oh, they've got VWs here. It doesn't spark getting new money. Yeah. So there's a problem. If yeah. VW are wrong, they need to be, it's moral fraud. It really is. I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to take the mic, but we have to because we are also streaming. Yeah. Sorry for the sound troubles we've had. Um, it's, we're trying to sort everything out. Now we're running on generators and then the electricity and the power cables and it's all a mess. So apologies and thank you for just... So, about the stream. So, yeah. about <laughs> yes, that is a very interesting story. So we started painting over it. Because, yes, that's the last thing that we want people to think, that we've got a big corporate sponsor behind us, because we do not. So, the birds haven't been able to go out. It was the first time in 12 years that it happened that the birds have not been able to go out for 10 years. If the birds don't go out, the conservation work suffers. But the conservation work will, will never stop. I've done two trips in three weeks to Stray Spy to go pick up penguins. Mm. The amount of injured birds, penguins, sick birds, it does not stop. Even if the birds don't go out, the birds needs to, it needs to go out because that's the only way that we can fund the conservation, the conservation work we do. So without folks welcome there and trying to paint over it, we do need a new sponsor. But we are counting like on you going there with your family, bring your family, going out on the birds, we absolutely rely on that. If the birds don't go out, we cannot fund that. But Wilfred will never ever say no for an animal in need. So we would still drive out. So we really, really, really need your support. To send people on the eco tours, on the whale watching, on the shark cage diving, so that we can fund all the conservation work. So you're right, but Volkswagen, we're not, it's so hard to just get through to them and just send another email and a follow up and say to them, hey, how are things going? Can we meet with you again? It's new people, they don't care. So all we have to do is buy paint and paint all over it and get a new sponsor or just rely on our boats going out and you supporting us and sending friends and families to go out on the whale and shark tours. I, yes. I, I take that, of course we will, people must support it, but Volkswagen shouldn't be, should, they not get away with that kind of thing. They've loved the, having their name attached to something needy and not giving a seat. That is moral fraud. Yeah, it mustn't just good. be, it mustn't, no, no, but it's Remember good. Remember the health does. Yeah, then they should be, it should say, like we will say like, thanks oh, to from 2009, yes, 2010. Yes, 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 but, but we were like, maybe it will get better, maybe they will come back to yeah, us, maybe, maybe and we were begging them, and exactly. we were. We were offering all kinds of things. <laughs> I don't know. And they said no. Trust me. And then the Volkswagen needs to be contacted and say, you know that you're committing fraud, moral fraud. I know, moral fraud, but they won't give us money. So, you have got a job. I'll see you tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock. Um, um, have we got any more questions, Corey? Yes. Wow! <laughs> Give me your question. He's got a question. Yes, for a course? Okay. Please. Regarding forecast, shark and plastic and shark attack, what's the impact? 
I also want to answer that, but now they're going to say I'm not a scientist, I'm not that. <laughs> You're welcome to. You're welcome to this. There we go. Okay, so I really, really want to answer that question, but because it's going to be published, I also want to do a marine evening of that in a couple of months' time. So I want to look at you some spoilers, but ask me, ask great. Um, okay, so that was a very, very interesting like observation as well. So the question was like, okay, between orcas, white sharks, and sunfish, is like if the sunfish are skyrocketing, the white sharks are declining, and the orcas are kind of moving through. How does that work? Now the interesting thing is. White sharks and orcas are both known to predate on sunfish. I don't know why, they, apparently they're quite tasty. Um, what's also very fascinating sidetrack is that sunfish are incredibly agile when it comes to dodging orcas, but it doesn't always work. Nevertheless, yes, uh, we, what's very fascinating is because we had a very uh, present white shark, you know, white shark presence in the bay, White, uh, sunfish numbers were, were very low. After 2017, the white shark numbers started to decline and the sunfish sightings started to go up. And obviously, like right in there, like if you look two years before that and two years after that, there's a mirror image flip, which is really, really fascinating, which kind of suggests that the white shark pressure on sunfish has been lifted and suddenly sunfish are just going like, woohoo, free real estate here. Uh, however, what's also fascinating is that the orcas are coming through and predating on sunfish. However, the orcas are not a consistent presence. They, like Kelly said, like we saw them once in February, we saw them once last month, like a week ago, a couple of weeks ago, there was like a few sightings. They're not very sporadic, so they literally like they come through, hang around for one day, if at most, and then they move on again. So that pressure, consistent pressure is not there. So it was also so initially around 2017 there was like a very interesting pivot. However, even after that the numbers have started to increase. So it suggests that there might be an, another underlying pressure factor at play. Uh, we suspect it might be sea surface temperature that it just becomes like a lot more pleasant for them over the last couple of years. However, that time frame does not necessarily uh, line up perfectly over the since. 1990 to 2000 or something around that, the Benguela has dropped in temperature about a half a degree on average. Uh, so it's, it has become a little bit colder, which might be a little bit more pleasant for them as well. However, the publication is very much like preliminary information, like a baseline, where you can see like, hey, there's this very interesting present pattern occurring here. Let's take a closer look at it. So yeah, the part of the reason why we're publishing it is to kind of provide like a uh, indicator saying like, hey guys, something's changing here. Now we need more funding to take a look at that as well. You 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 uh, saying earlier on that you've been uh, recently talking with Mossel Bay. Are they facing the same type of uh, uh, situation there? Uh, Are the sunfish coming up there? Is oh, the same? What is the situation with? the predation of great whites throughout the rest of South Africa, or, or is it specific to this area? So, uh, yeah, in regards to the white sharks, it's kind of like the orca seems to be like moving eastwards, and like they've uh, killed a white shark last month in Mossel Bay as well. Okay. In regards to sunfish, I'm actually not 100% sure, like we really focus with sunfish in this area. However, there is a student at UCT that is currently looking at sunfish sightings around South Africa and seeing like, is there a change in pattern nationwide? Uh, now that our uh, data has been accepted and once it's actually published and out there, we're gonna provide our data to her project as well. So it provides like a more information for her study to see what are these trends that are going on, not just locally here in Transbay, but nationwide, and are there patterns elsewhere as well? Uh, Sorry guys, I just quickly need to interrupt. We have a few questions online that I also need to share. Grandma, I've got a question from you, from Sam Gautier. So, <laughs> if orcas also prey on bronze whale sharks, and the second question is from Chris Cross. He wants to know, maybe not Grandma, maybe for us, 
What does the fresh water running into the bay mean for the animals that live there? Thank you. Okay, I'm going to take that one for Gronia. Um, so the question from Sam about the orca um, interaction with the bronze waders. Um, we have had evidence for orcas predating on bronze waders in the area as well. I believe it was in February 2020, 2019, 2020. So a few years ago, um, a carcass did wash up on the Walker Bay side of the area and the team examined that and the wounds were consistent with orca predation as well of course as the missing liver. So we do have evidence that the orcas do target the bronze whaler sharks. However, saying that, we haven't seen the same, the same flight response from the bronze whalers in the area. So when those orcas come through, um, as Gronia mentioned, uh, we see quite a quick exit from any white sharks that we have been seeing in the area. However, with the bronze whaler sharks, um, it doesn't seem to influence them to that extent. We haven't got, you know, those numbers or individuals leaving the bay with the sighting of the, the orcas. So there has been evidence of interaction, just not the same or to such an extent as the great whites. All right, and the other question by Chris was on the effect of the uh, fresh water runoff into the bay and what kind of an effect that has. Um, so what's very interesting is if you go to the Island Cross Estuary Mont at this point, you're going to see the fresh water going all the way down right up until the surf zone and then your ocean is kind of like pushing back right at that boundary. Now, there will be some fresh water obviously running off into the ocean, but because of the currents and all of that kind of stuff, it gets diluted relatively, diluted and scattered about relatively quickly. So in regards to an effect, um, there might be a very short, sure, small effect right there at the base where like the, like at the beach and like the Isle Cross and Front Scroll area and you might see some short term changes there. However, despite the fact that in some areas the marine environment is very sensitive, on the other side it's incredibly resilient and it will bounce back from that even if it's like a short term like fresh water push that comes through. So I wouldn't worry too much over it like the long term. There might be some sort of changes in the short term as a result of like a lot of fresh water coming through and the species there don't liking it very much. But again, yeah, uh, what marine environment is more resilient than we sometimes give it credit for. Yeah. They um yeah. Yeah, they look very similar and um, it happens sometimes uh, there's one thing when it helps. Um, Andrew last year when he after he finished malting, it happened that he kind of get a double horse um, double bend on his neck. And then if you walk in there for the first time and then you look at the other penguins, let's say you are used to a uh, humble penguin or Magellanic, and then you see, you know what, you can easily confuse the two. So every year it's always um, different, it's not the same. But I must say, um, the only way I tell people, you know what, these penguins, um, the only difference when you compare them to the other birds, yeah, they are very tough, they also um, cheeky. <laughs> they bite a lot. So which is now again the humpback penguins and um, they also have the similar, um, uh, I'll say they almost act the same way. So my African penguins, I'll just say um, the only difference from um, the other birds are that are tough and um, I'll tell people that um, they are the living proof that Africa is not for sissies. So yeah, <laughs> that's how I, I, uh, I identify them from the other birds there. So again, I tell people, if you handle African penguins, and uh, you're comfortable, and then that means you can handle any uh, penguin species there. So they are very different. Well, I, I just want to understand from a medical point of view, are they able to eat the breed? I've never um, heard that, but I think 
because we never have them in the same um, area or, or the aquarium, and they're also careful about that. They, I don't think they ever mix the two species. Then. But um, like um, the reason I'm saying this is that uh, it happens that we had, um, there was a macaroni penguin that was at the Eastern Cape, and then also at the same time there were uh, Okoba penguins. So we were told not to get them um, in one area because you can easily, if it happens that um, they breed, which is, there's no proof that they breed before, but it's, I think um, it might happen if you have them in the same area, like easy access them, yeah. Sylvia talked about identifying uh, broad-nosed salmonbill sharks and the short-tailed stingrays. Do you do the same thing for the bronzies that we see now? And if so, how do you do this? So with our bronze layers, we can do dorsal identification. And we do do a lot more with the white sharks as well. And we can also do subsurface identification with the gills and the tail and the counter coloration. Um, and we use Darwin, it's a program on the computer, just to identify it, so it does it for us. And um, yeah, thank you. Hey guys, we've got... Yeah. It may fall out of your ambits, but it happens in Khan's part. Um, if you are that last year sometime, and that back and forth up at the fish and chip shop there, with a full one time back you load that one into long shots. Um, what's the story? <laughs> okay, so even though like we don't like it at all, unfortunately sharks are legal to be caught. Uh, this is species specific, so obviously the white shark is protected. Other, uh, certain other species have certain protection measures in place as well. Um, however, if you've got the right permit, uh, there are fishing uh, practices that are, do allow for catching of and selling of shark species. So, yeah. Was the, was the rest of the question? Sorry? Well, it's legal. Yeah. So that's that much. Yeah. And really, who do we sell them to? <laughs> Ooh, that's also like. It, pretty much goes into, some of it is uh, local markets like Shark Biltong and stuff like that, others go to the international market, uh, China, Far East Asia, Australia. Uh, it's very tricky to designate it or like point a finger at somebody and say like, hey, our sharks are going to that place, uh, mainly because the data is not necessarily uh, readily available to show like where the animals are or like where the meat and stuff like that is going. So basically what you've got to do is follow the money. And unfortunately that falls outside of our range when it comes to like forensically tracking where do our catches go in that situation. Okay, that answers the question. Okay, everyone, uh, we do have a few questions that were submitted prior to the evening that uh, people would like answered. Okay, I'm going to, to try to answer this one. We did have a question relating to edible seaweed or plants. So the question was, what sea slash ocean plants and grasses are edible and can form part of the human diet? Where and how to harvest? How do you prepare? And what's the nutritional value? Is the uh, questioner in the room currently? <laughs> okay, this is, this is a, quite an involved question. I'll try to break it up. So, um, what seagrasses or plants are edible? Um, in your South African waters, it's estimated as a, there is approximately 800 different species of seaweed. Now, the south coast here is thought to be the most diverse. Uh, with approximately 250 to 300 species found in these southern waters. Can you eat them? Um, technically, you could eat them if you really wanted to. That's got a lot to do with personal taste, okay? So, um, are they all palatable, uh, texture and taste-wise? Not necessarily. 
Um, you might find that some of them are, are very tough, some of them are very bitter, um, and perhaps not that enjoyable. Uh, and there is one species that I would warn against, perhaps not to, to consume, and that is known uh, by the common name of acid seaweed. Um, now, that is a species of seaweed uh, from your brown algae family or group, and uh, it does have uh, abundance in areas where there's high levels of kelp forest. So we do have an abundance of the acid seaweed in our area here. And it, it has a pretty nifty little uh, chemical uh, property to it that will deter grazers from feeding on it. And that is that in the cells in that plant, uh, you're going to find sulfuric acid, okay? So I would say do not consume that one. Uh, you might not feel so well. Okay. Uh, so the next section of the question, where and how to harvest. Um, now, seaweeds have hold fasts. So they don't have the traditional root system. You're going to find that most uh, seaweeds are going to have to attach to a, a rocky substrate. Uh, so along your rocky shores is primarily where you're going to find seaweed that you can harvest. Uh, now, the aim would be to go at low tide, so you don't have to deal with the water, and of course, preferably, you know, for our spring tides when that water is is really low. Um, I would also mention that you should have a permit to harvest this. I don't want to get anyone in trouble. Uh, so you should have a permit to harvest uh, these things. Uh, and also, if you are harvesting, it's best to keep an eye out for areas that perhaps have, um, or steer clear of areas that have stagnant pools of water, or perhaps areas where there might be a bit of runoff just because you might have some contamination around those areas. Uh, how to harvest. Um, uh, I guess we can start off by saying do not pull the entire plant. So back to the whole fast again. Um, you know, given the chance, if you don't remove the entire plant, you'll see where you can actually regrow or rejuvenate. So if you are harvesting seaweed, um, it's recommended that you're only going to take about 50 percent, so half to three quarters of the plant to allow it to rejuvenate again. Um, so just a, a, a clipping of the plant. Um, yeah, how do you prepare it? Again, you know, this topic is very broad. It's dependent on the, the species itself and again, your, your personal taste. Um, it is completely fine to eat fresh raw seaweed. Uh, uh, if you want to do that, uh, a quick but thorough rinse and uh, you're good to go. Uh, if you do want to keep it for later, you can dry it and uh, that can easily be done in the sunlight um, on a nice flat, clean surface or hanging over a line and then stored in an airtight container for use at a later date. Again, you can eat it dry or you can rehydrate it and use it in a number of, of recipes. Nutritional value, again, very broad. Your seaweeds tend to fall into three different groups, uh, your green algae, your brown algae, and your red algae. Each of these groups, you can think of it like vegetables. You know, each group of vegetables has its own health benefits or nutritional value, and the same can be said for seaweed. Um, overall, what I can say broadly about the seaweed nutritional value, um, it is rich in vitamins, uh, such as, you know, your A, Bs, Cs. Um, for those of us that are lacking in our vitamin Bs, uh, many of your seaweed species are very high in B12. Uh, you're also going to find that it's rich in vitamins, um, but minerals, sorry. Um, I guess the important mineral to bring up with seaweed is iodine. Uh, the reason why I bring that one up is because we need it for thyroid function, but our bodies don't actually naturally produce it. We have to get it from our diet. And some of your species of seaweed are very high in iodine. Um, for example, some of the species, just one serving a day is enough of your iodine daily requirement. So one serving, let's say one cup. 
Uh, and of course, it's a amino, amino acid, so it is a, a healthy um, uh, product to consume. If we've got any vegetarians or vegans in the room, uh, you're also looking at a very high source of plant protein. Did I cover that? Yeah? <laughs> Apologies, that was quite a long-winded one. <coughs> oh, I will also mention, thank you, Ralph. Um, if anyone is keen to, to try some seaweed, uh, the Great White House does actually serve it. I see people going, no. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, just uh, here in the Great White House, the chef has given us a little bit of an idea of what he uses. Um, Uva, which is actually a, a green algae, it's quite uh, a popular one because it's got quite a mild taste to it. Um, kelp, of course. Uh, Laver. Laver is a part of the, the red algae family or group. Most of you have probably actually eaten that before. Um, has everyone tried sushi? Yeah? Laver is um, the group that uh, nori comes from. Okay? Dead man's finger and tongue, tongue weed. There we go. So the Great White House does uh, work magic with, with seaweed. Um, if anyone does want to give it a try. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm going to take the one at the top of the list, but it's kind of like across the board. Uh, it's a few questions, and they basically revolve around mar marine biology as a career. Um, if interested to become a marine biologist, which school subjects do you need? Um, is there any educational institutions available in our area to study marine biology? Is the facilities only available for young students? Is residency available? The cost to study marine biology and a typical day in a marine biologist's life. Uh, is the person who asked that here present? Yeah, yeah. Very interesting question, and it's like it's actually also a very difficult question to answer because it's just incredibly broad. It really depends on what are you looking for when marine biology comes to mind as a career. Uh, a lot of people say like, oh, I really want to become a marine biologist, and it's sometimes different than what you expect. Uh, so, which school subjects do you really need? Uh, again, it really depends on what you're looking for. Uh, we're scientists, so we need a lot of science subjects in school, and then when you go to university, follow the bio bio biology career path, basically, and tend to focus on the marine biology side going along the way. However, that's not just the only course available. Uh, some people, they want to dive and be in the underwater environment as much as possible. In that case, you don't have to go down the academic career path, get a dive license, uh, like scuba diving, and get practice in that. And once you're really like uh, comfortable in that area, get involved with people that will do, like need to collect data underwater, and you can become like a bi marine biology bi biologist by proxy, and like collecting data on behalf of other people, but still being involved in that environment. Uh, other people who are not comfortable being in the water or they're like not academically inclined, spread the word. Like science communication is so incredibly important as well, especially in today's day and age. You are okay. We're all sitting here like talking to you guys, but science communication is incredibly difficult, and a lot of scientists are not good at it. So you need those people who can translate that stuff really easy to the. A wider audience and not inundate people with highly technical jargon that's go, going to bore everyone to death. So being able to kind of like communicate properly and communicate it on somebody's behalf perhaps is also incredibly valuable uh, as a career. Um, and then yeah, what else is like we've got guys on the boat. It's like again, the science girl like communicating science, collecting data around the same time. Uh, we've got crew on the board that are absolutely fantastic involved with marine biology. So again, like it kind of depends on what do you see yourself or what does a person see themselves when it comes to marine biology that kind of defines which direction. Hello. All right. Uh, it, 
Is there any education? Oh, do you want me to pause for this live streaming or shall I just continue? We can hear it. Yeah. Okay, let's um, continue. Ralph, sorry, just to interrupt. I think the live streaming is done for now.